No research project of this scale, scope, and significance could succeed without an extraordinary scientific champion and leader. Dr. Chris Barnes fulfills that role and much more besides. His career achievements are manifold, and Neptune Canada is a fitting capstone for a person who has been such a high achiever throughout his scientific career. Chris, we thank you and applaud your leadership. You have every reason to be proud of what you and the very dedicated Neptune Canada team have accomplished to bring us to today. Chris Barnes. Well, this is truly a great day for the Neptune Canada team and uh, all the groups that have worked with us. I'll remind you that uh, 40 years ago this month was when the first human landed on the moon. And you'll recall that uh, Neil Armstrong looked back on Earth and sent those images of the blue planet, planet Earth, 70% covered by the oceans. And I thought that brought to the uh, public uh, really the essence of what planet Earth is. 15 years ago, US scientists at NOAA mused about the possibility of adding sensors to discuss, to, to uh, uh, to disuse telecommunication cables to allow for the first time real-time ocean observations. But 10 years ago, other US scientists, in particular John Delaney at the University of Washington and Alan Chave at Woods Hole, aspired higher to build a system that used new state-of-the-art uh, cables. So the Neptune project was essentially born at that time and formally became a binational dream and uh, objective in 2000 when a joint Canada-US Memo of Understanding was signed and an executive team established. There were three other Johns that deserve uh, special mention for their leadership, one's already been mentioned, but in that early concept design stage. John McDonald and John Madden uh, for their leadership uh, in the Institute of Pacific Ocean Science and Technology, and also in particular John Garrett who was a key steward for many of the science workshops and, uh, and grant proposals. On behalf of Neptune Canada, I reiterate our deep appreciation for the funding of the infrastructure, some of which you will see here today, but only some of it, and for the initial operating funds from CFI, BCKDF, NSERC, and Canary, as well as the funding and in-kind support from the University of Victoria and many partners that are recognized in our exhibits. Delays in the U.S. funding required Canada to forge ahead alone, but we are delighted to note that a formal contract should be signed this month between the National Science Foundation and the Ocean Leadership Consortium for their Ocean Observers Initiative. Our main subsea infrastructure funding in late 2003 and 2006 brought us to this final installation phase that we're beginning to see here today. You've heard about the 800 uh, kilometer backbone that's already out there, to which the five nodes, which you'll see more in a few minutes, will be added over the next six weeks. The ship there will come in every week and pick up a new node, all being well. To those nodes be connected by secondary cables, junction boxes, which you'll see in our exhibits, and several hundred sensors and instruments, a few deployed from the Atlantis, but mainly using the University of Washington's Thompson over four weeks, beginning in mid-August. A key technology used throughout both installation phases is the Canadian remotely operated vehicle, Ropos, already on board the Atlantis. You'll see the Atlantis on your uh, cruise down to the, to the dock. After a month of complex commissioning, live data and imagery should start to flow in mid-November. You've heard that the design, the manufacture, and installation of the subsea infrastructure was contracted to Alcatel Lucent. Our engineering team, led by Peter Phipps, has overseen this huge undertaking and contributed to the innovative designs, as well as to the junction box development by Oceanworks in Vancouver. Testing of over 40 different types of scientific instruments has been carried out by Highland Technologies overseen by Mario Brest and Brian Bornhol at the UX Marine Technology Center in Sydney. And the data management systems and observatory control systems have been developed uh, through our team uh, in Natural Canada, led by Benoit uh, Perrin. 
Today we are able to witness just a fraction of the complex innovations, equipment, and tools for the world's first regional cable observatory. Significant socio-economic benefits to date are partly evidenced by an exhibit that we put up listing over 200 businesses that have been involved with us to date. More benefits will flow, spurred by the 50 terabytes of data annually and, and along with the scientific and technological breakthroughs uh, that we hope will and anticipate will, uh, will flow as well. But I remind you that our planet and humankind are at a critical threshold. Changes to the environment, to our climate, to life, and the life support systems are increasingly profound and disturbing. Radical new approaches to science information, public policy, and public knowledge are urgently needed. Today, we are at the forefront, as was heard earlier, of wiring the oceans to provide solutions and options for humankind. Canada is leading the way, and as it was 40 years ago, we are entering a new area of science with the transformation of ocean science through this uh, observatory system. So finally, on behalf of the Neptune Canada Project and our team, all our staff, for the participating scientists from many different agencies, our consortium of universities from coast to coast, thank you for the ongoing support to those institutions represented on the platform, to all those for attending today, and particularly for all those that organized this wonderful event. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Chris, and again, congratulations to you and the whole Neptune Canada team. As Chris has mentioned, an event like today takes a great deal of organization, particularly in a setting such as this. And I would particularly like to thank Jim Milne, the general manager of the Esquimalt Graving Dock, and all his staff, as well as the staff of Victoria Shipyards, who have gone extraordinarily out of their way to make today a success. Finally, special thanks are due to the UVic team, who have worked so tirelessly and enthusiastically to prepare for today. And I especially want to recognize Kara St. John, Nikki McDonald, Bruce Kilpatrick, Leslie Elliott, and Elizabeth Redpad. Thank you very much to all of you. Now for the grand finale. We'd like to invite all our guests to watch as a Neptune notepad is lowered from the deck of the Alcatel Lucent cable ship, the Lodbrog. The Lodbrog, together with the research vessel, Atlantis, which is just alongside it, will soon leave to install Neptune's equipment on the Pacific Ocean sea floor. So if you would, please join the platform party and our distinguished guests at the dockside to watch this maneuver.
Hätten.